and the Gospel of Mark, and the Gospel of Luke, and the Gospel of John. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll start with Matthew, chapter 28. Matthew 28. You'll be one page from Mark uh, if you're in Matthew 28. So, Matthew chapter 28, and then we will go to Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts. And we're going to just skip Romans tonight. We're not going to preach from Romans at all, <laughs> but we'll be in those others. We'll be in 1 Corinthians and Hebrews and Revelation and uh, Colossians. So, well, I um, just continue on in our series on transcendent truth, truths that transcend, things that when you uh, really come to the realization and an understanding of those truths, they actually are Groundbreaking. In other words, if, if you never realize them, they'll be a stumbling block to you and you'll, you'll veer off. They'll get you off course in one way or another. But if you do realize them in a, in a way, in a sense, you'll literally go to the next level or you'll turn a corner and get beyond where you were before and probably never go back to that place. And so these are important truths. There's a lot of them actually in life. And one of the things that we emphasize when we began this series is that, you know, the devil's been around for a while. And he's got quite an arsenal of deception, quite a few ways to get a guy off, take you for a ride, and to keep you uh, from accomplishing God's purpose for your life. You ever wonder about what the devil's motive for your life is? Like, what, if the devil had his way with my life, what would be his motive? A lot of times we think, well, you know what, he wants us to go to hell. Well, that's not a possibility if you know Jesus. So that isn't what he's trying for. Sometimes we think, well, he wants me to do evil. He wants me to circumvent God's plan, God's work. We'd be happy with that, but I'll be honest with you. I think most of what the Satan wants for your life is just for you to do nothing. If he could just get you off, just get you misdirected or misguided or out of focus, uh, then you'll just squander your life and you won't, affect, you won't affect eternity. You won't affect other people for eternity and you won't affect... You won't have made an effect for yourself for eternity, and he'd be perfectly content with that. I think that many times the devil is a master at giving something that you cannot in and of itself say that's sin or that's wicked or that's evil. It just isn't what God wants mm -hmm. in your life. Just something just to get you to veer off. Just something to keep you from what God wants in your life. And uh, he's been around a while. You know, some Christians, sometimes we think we're pretty wily. We think we're pretty smart. And, uh, you know... Anthony and I were chatting about this the other day. We were just talking about how smart I am. And uh, it was a good conversation, wasn't it, Anthony? And <laughs> it was very edifying for me. You know, I, I told him about how that almost every teenager gets to a certain age when they realize how smart their dad is. You remember ever realizing, my dad wasn't as stupid as I thought. I thought he didn't understand anything that was going on. He didn't know anything about life. And then when I turned like 20, and I looked at the way my dad has managed his life, and I realized my dad was really a smart guy. And, uh, and it just all of a sudden, dad got way more intelligent than they gave him credit for before. And, you know, I think sometimes we're kind of silly when we forget about how long the Satan's been around and how little time we've spent on this earth. And we think we're pretty clever and we've got things figured out. And actually, we don't want to give too much place or credit to the devil. And so let's go ahead and read in... Um, Matthew chapter 28, we'll read the first verse, and I'll just be straightforward with you tonight on what our topic is, and then we'll prove it from the Scripture, and we'll be done. Verse 1, the Bible says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. So Father, I pray that you would help us with our comprehension tonight to understand, Lord, what exactly... Uh, you would have us to know from your word this evening about this first day of the week, and I pray that as a result of our comprehending it, that you would help us to put to rest or put aside foolish notions or uh, applications from things that are just wrong from the Scripture, and so that we would substitute them for the truth and clear way of thinking. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to talk to you this evening about the first day of the week. And I'll be truthful with you. This is one uh, that I think that perhaps, I don't know, I was probably really in my 20s before, and you know, sometimes in some ways I was a late bloomer. Uh, but I was probably in my 20s before it really clicked, where I really had clarity on the matter of worshiping the Lord and the difference between the Sabbath and the Lord's Day. 
know, a lot of Christians talk about, you know, we don't want to do this on the Sabbath. Okay, so let me give you, for instance, growing up, we had standards in our household, and it just is a little bit insightful on what a different day we live in, actually, than when I was growing up. But we had some standards in our household on where we would buy fuel. I know you say, Pastor, seriously, I still do. I don't buy from Sitco, and Hugo Chavez is still dead, but I don't buy from Sitco or any Venezuelan oil company. Uh, I just, I've got some standards because of that. I avoid Circle K because they were one of the first uh, gas stations to sell pornography and really promote it and put it out where kids could see it and that sort of thing. And I just said, you know, I don't want anything to do with it. But when I was a kid, my parents put it this way. They said, uh, we don't buy gas from a gas station that sells dirty magazines or cigarettes. Those were the two things that we wouldn't buy gas from if you, if you sold from it. So I remember we uh, patronized an Amico station when I was a kid, and it was also full service. And so you'd pull up, and the attendant would come out, and he'd pump your gas and check your oil and wash your windshield and take your money and didn't charge anything extra for it at the same prices as a lot of the other gas stations. But we were pretty conscientious about that. And that same Amico station was also closed on Sunday. They wouldn't, weren't open on Sunday. And so we would say, you know what, we don't buy, we try not to buy anything on the Sabbath day is the way we would put it when we were growing up. We don't buy groceries on the Sabbath day. And you know something actually uh, that was, we weren't just radicals in the town in which we lived up. That was actually pretty well normal uh, where we were growing up. I remember on a Sunday morning, uh, we would get up and we would be heading out to go to church. Our family would. And if you look down the street, there would be a lot of neighbors waving at each other, and everybody was getting up and going to church somewhere when I was growing up on a Sunday morning. That's the way it was. And we would be offended in our neighborhood if on a Sunday afternoon somebody would mow grass. They'd cut grass on a Sunday afternoon. We thought, you know, it's, a, it's supposed to be quiet on Sunday. It's supposed to be a day off. It's the Sabbath. It's a day of rest. And here we're trying to rest, and you're out cutting grass, making noise in the neighborhood. And I'm just telling you, that's the way it was when I grew up. That's the, that's the, how many of y'all, you, this is the way it was for you as well. Now, I realize South Florida is a different part of America, um, and not quite America in many ways, but that's the way it was when I grew up. And it wasn't unusual, it wasn't abnormal. Uh, my dad, uh, he and the other car dealers in the city of Salina, where we grew up, they had a pact. They had an agreement that nobody sold cars on Sunday. No Salina businessmen. And they had the, a Salina Businessmen's Association. And no Salina businessmen opened on Sunday, no one who was a part of the association. And so you didn't have to worry about competition. You know, if I don't open, then this guy, you know, if I don't sell a car and somebody wants to buy a car, he couldn't buy a car in Salina on Sunday. It was an agreement between the Businessmen's Association and uh, you'd get blackballed out of the auctions or something would happen if you tried to uh, sell a car on Sunday. That was the way. It isn't that way anymore, by the way, in Salina. And uh, so that's kind of the mindset that I grew up with. And I always assumed that the Sabbath was a day of rest. And I always assumed that the Sabbath was Sunday. But when I read the Bible, I realize it isn't. And so there had to be some rearranging, I guess, in my way of thinking. I used to be stymied when church people would say, Pastor, you're pushing us too hard. No, I can't teach Sunday school on Sunday. It's too much work. If I have to get up in the morning and I have to get there early and I have to prepare my class and I have to prepare my lesson and I have to teach Sunday school, and if I get involved in this and that in church, well, then I'm going to be worn out. Sunday will not be a day of rest for me. And, you know, I think the bus ministry died over this whole thing because bus work is hard work. The bus workers are the first people at church. They're the first ones to leave and come back. And then everybody leaves church and they go and drive people home and then they come back. The bus workers, it's a lot of work working a bus. And I don't know how many people told me, you know, Pastor, I just don't believe in bus ministry because I just don't think we should work on the Sabbath. I think it should be a day of rest. And, and it always is confusing to me because I'm thinking, shouldn't we be reaching people on Sunday? Shouldn't we be reaching the lost? Shouldn't we be uh, serving on Sunday? And so those, those statements would stymie me a lot of times. And I'd feel like, you know, man, you don't want to ask too much of people. You know, pastor, I guess, is kind of the only mercenary that works on Sunday. You know, he, he'll work on Sunday, but nobody else should. And so 
I know for me, it was there's a lot of confusion about that. And then you have the Seventh-day Adventist who say the Sabbath is Saturday, not Sunday, and so we should have church on Saturday instead of Sunday. And you start looking at it, and the Sabbath is the seventh day of the week, and it is Saturday on the calendar day. And so then you wonder, well, you know what? Why don't we worship on Saturday? And the answer is because that was never the way it was done, and there is a simple reason in the Bible for it and a precedent for it. And let's just look at it tonight, and let's get settled on it so we can be helped by it, okay? Uh, and, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave the other groups alone. Uh, except I, I would mention that Messianic Christians, Christians who emphasize their Judaism when they get saved in the church age and emphasize being part of Israel more than they emphasize being part of the church, they also worship on the Sabbath day, on Saturday instead of Sunday. And uh, I will say they miss it. They miss the whole idea. And so let's look at distinctly what the, what the Sunday is and uh, let's draw some conclusions from it. It won't take us too long. But let's just look what the Scripture says, draw some conclusions and hopefully have it down in a way that will provide us permanent answers. Okay, so in verse 1, the Bible says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And, and here we have the account of Mary and Mary Magdalene witnessing the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, so we will see first of all from Matthew chapter 28 that the first day of the week is the day when our Lord Jesus was risen. Now, the Sabbath day is a day that Jesus was in the grave. The Lord's day, or the first day of the week, is the day that Jesus was risen. And I will uh, tell you that it adds clarity in the life of a Christian to realize that the reason we meet and worship on the first day of the week is because of the resurrection. Matter of fact, if you wanted to just fill in the blank and say the reason we, blank, 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 whatever you want to put in there, for a Christian is because of the resurrection is pretty much a sentence that universally fits. In other words, the resurrection is everything for us. Isn't it? I mean, without the resurrection, the Bible puts it this way, if Christ be not risen, your faith is in vain. You're getting your sins. Paul goes on further to elaborate. He says, we're just false witnesses. We're just preaching, just, just preaching religion and trying to force on you our opinions. And it's nothing more than that. It's just religion. And so the resurrection is everything for a believer. And the resurrection is everything when we worship. See, one of the things we ought to be mindful of on the first day of the week when we get up is Jesus Christ is risen. And this is the day of the week that He was risen. And so I want to see the precedent for that. I want to make sure that you understand the witness of the Gospels as well. So if you look at Mark 16, if you can turn there quickly enough before I start reading, I want to look at, again, an account of Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James. And in verse 2, the Bible says, And very early in the morning of the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. So we know that Matthew said it was the first day of the week at dawn, and Mark said it was the first day of the week at the rising of the sun. Let me help you to understand that the Sabbath day has always begun at evening. It's always begun on, at evening on Friday. So Sabbath would have been well over with by this time. And so, uh, uh, I should have said Saturday. Uh, Friday, I'm sorry, sa Friday evening, the Sabbath day uh, begins, and the Sabbath day ends Saturday evening. If you wanted to study that and look at the Sabbath, which isn't really our study this evening, you could see very, very easily in the Scripture, uh, even when Jesus was doing work and healing, that people came to Him at the end of the day on the Sabbath day, toward evening on the Sabbath day is when the multitudes came to Jesus to be healed of sicknesses and diseases and so forth. And so even in Christ's ministry, after the Sabbath and really on the first day of the week is when Jesus' work began. And so it helps me to understand as a believer, first of all, that the first day of the week is not a day of rest. The first day of the week is the first day that we work. It's the first day that we do something. Now, we have in our culture, we have adopted, at least in American culture, for the most part traditionally, we have adopted the five-day work week, which is a Christian concept. See, a six-day work week uh, was before, before the resurrection would have been common. But as, as uh, societies became Christian, then they went to a five-day work week. Now we have done away with worship on 
the first day of the week, and we have kind of morphed it into being the catch-all, time off, time for me, uh, time. And the reality of it is, is that for believers, the first day of the week was never about the person. The Sabbath, the Bible says over and over and over again, is for man and not man for the Sabbath. But the first day of the week actually has never been for man. The way we are to understand it as Christians is that the first day of the week, that is the Sunday where we worship the Lord Jesus Christ, is instead of going to our job, we give our day to Jesus to worship Him and God provides for us and makes us able to do it. In other words, you remember when God established Israel and He made them promise, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? And along with the promise, you keep the Sabbaths and you keep even the Sabbath years where you let the land rest every seventh year and uh, you practice the year of Jubilee. And I promise you that you'll have an early rain and a latter rain. I promise you that you'll have enough in the six years to make up for that year off. And I promise you, you'll have enough in the six days to make up for that seventh day. Now let me ask you, practically speaking, what's a better deal? Getting the same amount from five as you get from seven? Or having to work seven and not quite having enough even though you work seven? I mean, that literally, literally is the alternative. I have my whole life witnessed this. and I'm not trying to preach some kind of Sunday... Uh, worship doctrine where you never for any reason ever miss church on Sunday. I just think you should never for any reason miss church on Sunday. That's the way I feel about it. So I'm not preaching as a doctor. It's just what I believe. Okay? So just trying to be as unbiased or, or uh, reveal my bias as much as I possibly can so you'll know where I'm coming from. I have my whole lifetime watched people who are so committed to worshiping the Lord Jesus on Sunday that they don't allow an exception. And I have seen God provide for them and, and where they've always had enough or more than enough. And I have my whole life seen people who did not believe that they could trust God by giving Him that on Sunday, and I have always noticed that they never have enough. See, the reality of it is one of the things we forget sometimes is that nothing we have, including ourselves, is our own. And one of the things we forget sometimes is that it's very, very easy for us to think that, hey, if i got another day and I earned in it, or I did this in it, then I'd be better off. But we forget that everything we have comes from God, and that God's good enough to give us just as much in five as He could give us in seven. You understand the difference in numbers? In other words, five days with God's blessing goes a lot further than seven days without. And there's just a principle there of faith and trusting God where God honors our faith. Now you say, Pastor, I don't know if I buy into that quite. Well, try it. Try it sometime. When I was in high school... I just believe that you shouldn't, you know, I, again, I told you how I grew up. I just believe that a Christian shouldn't work on Sunday. And I always refused to. Let me just tell you something. I've never, until I became a pastor, I never had to work a job where I had to work on Sunday. And I never had to work a job where I even had to work on Wednesday nights because I just flat refused to. I said, God, I'm going to worship you. I'm going to give you this time. I'm not going to let anything else become a priority over it. And I will promise you that God has blessed me for it. He's taken care of me. I've never lacked anything for committing to God those things. I have a question. So, so you're telling me that you got your whole life outside. Of, <coughs> like, say, for example, right? You got a new job. Mm -hmm. And they would probably work on Sundays. But yeah, I'd, be, I'd just walk away from that job. So you see you go walk away? Yeah, I sure would. I like that. Thing. I'm just telling you what I've done. Uh, when I was in high school, I, uh, I went to private school. And we were involved in a lot of things. I played basketball and football, and we were involved in extracurricular activities like choir and music and a lot of things. We did academic competitions, and we're pretty heavily involved in high school. It was a small school, and we competed with a lot of larger schools in other states. And so in order to compete, our uh, teachers and principals would just, like, make us do everything. You know, I, I didn't compete in music or math or speech or... Uh, whatever. I competed in everything there was. I just do all this. I was pretty busy, but I remember uh, about March of one year, uh, my junior year of high school, my mom said, you got too much time, you need a job. And so there was a new Taco Bell going up, and I went and applied at Taco Bell. And uh, the lady who was hiring, she liked me. She said, you know what, I, I guarantee I'll, I'll hire you. I said, there's only one thing, I don't work Sundays or Wednesday nights. Well, that kind of for Somebody hiring for fast food, that kind of makes you not have nearly as much value. And she said, well, you know something? I mean, Sunday is really the day when we try to give our full-time employees off. 
And that's what we really need high school students for, is to work the weekends and to work the evenings. And if you take one evening away and you take one day away, there's not really a lot for you. I told the lady, I said, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I'd like to work here, but I can't. See, you stay, see, you stay with your parents. So imagine you've got your own, your own yeah. place. Well, I don't anymore, Rodney. I live with my wife now. She takes care of me now. Oh, okay. Instead of my parents. But you got to look at some of my that um, understand life. Like, uh -huh. They got their own house, their own bills. Yeah. And they, they got to get a new job. They say, hey, well, we need to work on the Sure. You know that you got your food to be paid. And they say, you can't work on the We won't hire you. Yeah, well, so here's what happened with me. They said, well, we really don't hire anyone. That, that unless they work Sundays and, and any night that we need you. Unless you're just available for all these hours, we won't hire you. And I said, okay, then they said, well, we'll make an exception for you. And see, the thing is, is that I, one of the things I realize is that there's people that don't care about honoring God that work those days and hours. They don't, they don't actually have to have you work then. And I also found out that God can give you something else. Uh, so they do what they always do. The first thing is they put you on schedule for Sunday and Wednesday night just to see if you really mean it. And so I remember that going to the, my manager and saying, hey, there's a mistake in the schedule. And she said, well, you know, I'm really sorry. That isn't a mistake. We, just this week, just this week, we don't have anyone to work on Sunday. Can you just work just this week? And, man, if you work that one week, my friend, your convictions are out the window. You, you don't believe it. You don't mean it. And I told her, I said, I'm real sorry about that. I just won't be, I won't be able to come in. But I'll come in Monday, you know, or whatever. And, uh, you know, she kind of gave me a hard time about it. You know, that was the last time I ran a problem with that. And they found out, uh, and God blessed me at that job. And uh, they found out that they could use me other times of the week and that I was profitable and I was valuable. By the way, you've got to be a good worker, too. Uh, you know, if you've got somebody that's not a good worker and then they don't want to work on Sunday on top of it, well, they just don't need you. They don't need somebody who isn't a good worker. I didn't want to spend a lot of time on that explanation, really the personal illustration doesn't mean much, but I did have to pay for college at that time. Uh, I had to, had to get my college paid for. I had to work a lot of extra hours. I worked 80 hours a week when I graduated high school uh, and trying to trying to make enough cash that I didn't have to go into debt for college because I knew I couldn't serve the Lord and do ministry. And I, you know, I was always able to work a lot of hours, a lot of hours in a week that aren't that don't belong to the Lord and to worshiping the Lord. Mm -hmm. My point is this: all I was trying to illustrate is that my personal observation is that if you commit something to, to God and you believe it's right, God will honor it. And it's a lot better deal. The question was, is it a better deal to work five or work seven and have the same? Or work five and have everything you need and work seven and not have enough. That's usually how it ends up. I found out people that don't believe they can trust God never have enough. And so that's what I want to say. Okay, now, uh, we pointed out the first day of the week why is it we worship on the first day of the week? Well, because it's the day of the resurrection. Okay, what is worship all about? Well, it's all about Jesus. It's all about the resurrection. Okay, so why is it that Christians worship on Sunday? The resurrection. Let's go to Luke 24 and verse 1. The Bible says, Upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them, and they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. Okay, so the resurrection happened when? Sunday. The first day of the week, Sunday. Okay? Uh, go to John chapter 20. Let's read verse 1. The Bible says, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Okay, so when did she come? Early the morning of the first day of the week. So we could say that there's something about that first day of the week that each of the disciples who gave a personal eyewitness account and in included and also excluded other details, it's fascinating to me uh, that the mention of the time that Jesus was risen and the day that Jesus was risen, the time and the day that Jesus was risen are included in all four accounts. Not every detail of each account is included in each of the Gospels. Each Gospel gives a different perspective. It's really interesting if you just take four people that were at the same place and saw the same thing happen and ask four people what happened, how different their take is on what actually happened. And we have a little bit of that variation in each of the four Gospels. But one thing that we do not have any variation on in the Gospels, and I'm not talking about differences, I'm just talking about one guy told this and didn't tell this. Another guy told something else and didn't tell this or this when they gave their account. And so one of the things that was accounted for, though, was the first day of the week. Do you see that? 
and even the way that it's phrased in the Scripture, the first day of the week, it's there, and it's there on purpose. It's not in the Scripture by accident. It's, but it's interesting because we never read uh, Matthew 28, 1, Mark 16, 2, Luke 24, 1, or John 20 and verse 1. We don't read them all at the same time. If we read them all at the same time, we'd say, what are some things that stand out here? The first day of the week would stand out to us, wouldn't it? But the fact is that usually when we read the Scripture, we don't read it that way. We don't read each of those verses at the same time. And so the emphasis of it, uh, we miss just a little bit. Um, I want to look at, while we're in John chapter 20 as well, at verse 19. The Bible says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said, that Peace be unto you. Okay, so on the first day of the week in the evening, after the resurrection, the disciples hadn't been all together at any time and seen Jesus. And they're locked in, a, in an upper room, the door's shut, and Jesus walks in while the door's shut. This is where Jesus breathes on them and says, Receive you the Holy Spirit. And so we see that the time when Jesus emphasized that the Spirit of God now lived in us and that the promise which He had made before the cross, I will not leave you comfortless, but the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in My name, uh, He'll come unto you and He'll teach you all things. This is what Jesus said when He said, it's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the uh, Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, will not come unto you. So when Jesus said it's expedient for you, He's saying it's, you're better off with the Comforter, which is another uh, of me. In other words, the, other, the, the word that describes the Holy Spirit and the indwelling Spirit of God is that He's exactly like Jesus. It's another one of me. That's why we call the Holy Spirit's living in us the Spirit of Christ. Christ in us. When we say Jesus lives in my heart, that's very accurate because that is the representation of the Holy Spirit of God. See, the disciples got to follow Jesus. They had got to be wherever Jesus was, they could go with Him, except for times when He would send them away and then come and meet them. They were concerned that He was going to die because their question was, what about us? Literally, for three years of our lives, we have been dependent on our daily schedule, our daily provision. Everything we've done has just been to follow you. And now you're going to leave us. What are we going to do? How are we going to carry on your work without you to follow? And Jesus said, well, I've got something better for you than just following me. What's better for you is that I'm going to live in you. And I'll never leave you or forsake you. And see, that's better. And when is it that Jesus came to the disciples and breathed on them and said, receive you the Holy Ghost? The first day of the week. So that's somewhat significant, isn't it? In other words, there's something about the first day of the week and the resurrection that makes it a very, very special holiday. A very, very special day. In other words, it appears that for the believers, the first day of the week is a day when it's a day that's set aside for, for worshiping God and for God to work. Small wonder God isn't working a great deal when most of what we do on the first day of the week has nothing to do with Jesus. And we ought to let that settle in a little bit. I mean, with how much we give Jesus on His day, we call it the Lord's Day. That's what it's called in Revelation chapter 20. I mean, chapter 1. We call it the Lord's Day. Small wonder the Lord is doing so little when He has so little of our attention on His day, the first day of the week. Uh, let's go to Acts chapter 2 and I'll see something else. Another manifestation differently. And again, it's not what we're preaching about. I'm not preaching about the work and ministry of God's Holy Spirit. But in Acts chapter 2, this would be a difference, uh, a difference between... Uh, in Acts chapter 2, this would be a difference between the Spirit of God living in us and the Spirit of God coming upon us with fullness of power. This would be the Spirit of God, the way that God's Spirit came on Jesus and rested on Him. And in His entire ministry, instead of Jesus performing miracles and following uh, His own will... Jesus performed miracles through the power that was given to Him. Instead of His own power, He did everything through the power of the Spirit of God. God's Spirit. See, God's a person. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And the third person of God came and dwelt on Jesus at His surrender at His baptism. And that's what the time Jesus 
by his baptism had identified with his own death and had laid down his ability as God, his, if you will, immortality, his uh, ability, uh, his difference from being a man, and he surrendered to the will of the Father, and God's Spirit came and dwelt on him, and he was led by the Spirit and worked in the Spirit. And that's why when Jesus said, the works that I do, greater works than these shall ye do. That seems like blasphemy to me, doesn't it to you? Can you imagine if anyone except Jesus had said, greater works than these shall ye do because I go unto my Father? Would that seem, if I were to say to you, I'm going to do some bigger things than Jesus does, what would you think about me? But Jesus said, you're going to do greater works than I'm going to do because I go to my Father. And He's talking about the empowering of the Spirit of God. Literally, you can do and have a more effective ministry than Jesus Himself did. And a day when that actually happened was on the day of Pentecost, which brings us to our text here in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. The Bible says that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, if you just study up on the day of Pentecost, when the day of Pentecost was fully done, you know what day that was? It's the first day of the week. It's the first day of the week. That's somewhat coincidental, but not really, is it? Why was it that on the first day of the week they were all in, of one accord in one place? You think they all slept in the same room and didn't leave for 30 days? Why did they come together on the first day of the week? Because of the resurrection. See, the, with the moment the resurrection happened, the first day of the week became to the apostles and to the disciples a very, very important day. In other words, it was never the same. You and I, no, you and not I, can relate somewhat to this uh, because of your birthdays. This year, my birthday falls on the week of taking teenagers to the Bill Rice Ranch, and I promise you I will not care one iota which day that falls on. My birthday doesn't mean much to me, but your birthday might mean a lot to you. And so uh, I know for parents, especially parents that dearly wanted children and received children, the birthdays of their children are a special day. What one-year-old remembers their birthday? What one-year-old remembers their birthday? What one parent of a one-year-old doesn't celebrate a birthday with the one-year-old? You know, you've got to get you know, cake on your face and that sort of thing. What, what does a one-year-old care about that? It's just another day to them. I mean, they'll smear cake in their face any day. It doesn't matter. There's no discrimination as far as days being different. Uh, you know, for one-year-old, you know, and one man esteemeth one day above another, another man esteemeth every day alike. One-year-olds, they're all alike. Every day is the same. You know, I happen to be smearing cake this day instead of hot dogs and whatever one year old smear normally, whatever it can be. My point is this when your child is born, their birthday becomes significant instantly, doesn't it? I mean, it doesn't even matter how many kids you have, I mean, it's just their birthday. You know, it's not like, you know, hey, mom, you know when my birthday is? No, I don't remember. No, it's something significant that happened on that day, and uh, you remember it. Because it matters. And I'm only emphasizing that so that you'll realize that for the disciples, the first day of the week became something very, very special. There wasn't ever a first day of the week that the disciples thought, you know, there's just nothing special about this day. No, every first day of the week they remembered, this is the day Christ has risen. Matter of fact, it's, I've adopted that. I've caught that spirit. Uh, Sunday morning is the one day of the week I like to get out of bed. It's the one day of the week I go outside and, and if, it's, if it's cloudy and it's raining, it still looks like the sky is blue. It's just that day for me. Honestly, the first day of the week is the Resurrection Sunday. And you know, when we celebrate what we call Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, it's just one more of those days for me. Because there's 52 of them every year. It's the first day of the week. And the day of Pentecost is when the power came down and when the disciples literally saw take place what Jesus had promised, greater works than these shall you do because I go unto my Father. They preached the gospel to the same people who crucified Jesus, and about 3,000 souls were saved. And that kept happening over and over again. The power of the Spirit came down on the first day of the week. Now, I'm not saying God's Spirit is limited to Sunday. I'm just saying that when it first happened, it was the first day of the week. Okay? Let's move through. We are actually, believe it or not, not terribly far from being finished. Since we're in Acts, let's go to chapter 20. And let's look at verse 7. Acts chapter 20, and let's go down to verse 7. Uh, look at this. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Now isn't that great? 
the disciples came together on the first day of the week to break bread, and Paul started preaching, and he was still preaching at midnight. So how much, how much of the first day of the week was given to coming together about Jesus? What do you think Paul was preaching about? The stock market? The Roman Empire? What was he preaching about? Jesus, Jesus right? Okay, so Paul comes, preaches. This is, this is the one, I think, where the guy falls out of the window because Paul put him to sleep. Okay, Eutychus, is that the name of the fellow? Yeah. Eutychus falls out the window because Paul preached too long. So the motto there is, at midnight, the first day of the week's over, and you're going to kill somebody if you keep on. So stop it. <laughs> it's time to quit. And No, that's not. The, the emphasis here, though, is that we are able to look at the early church and just look at an account of something that happened. And what happened what that was given was, oh, on the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. And when they came to get bread, together to break bread, Paul preached. What did he preach? Well, he preached the resurrected Christ is what he preached. And so we see some of the things that happen on Sunday. Sunday is a time when the brethren come together and where they preach. You say, Pastor, I like the idea of breaking bread. Well, there is a connotation of two things. One is the Lord's Supper, remembrance of Jesus. And I think that it's appropriate for the Lord's Supper to be done on the Lord's Day. Oftentimes we do the Lord's Supper on Sunday evening actually because it's important that lost people uh, don't eat or drink of the Lord's Supper and uh, die or get sick or something terrible happen as a result. It's a serious matter, uh, the matter of what churches, a lot of people traditionally call communion, it's the Lord's Supper. Uh, but the reality of it is it appears that these people were in for the long haul and they ate together on Sunday, much like many of us do on Sunday afternoons when we go to Taco Bell, which is much against the principles that I used to live by when I was a kid because if Taco Bell had been open on Sunday, we wouldn't have eaten there because it's the Lord's or it's a Sabbath day. It isn't actually a Sabbath day. And so, uh, you know, all things in balance uh, as, as a believer, but, but our conscience ought to weigh things and consider them. And we see here that the believers preached and came together what day of the week? First. The first day of the week. Let me just pause here for some application. So, if a new church comes on the scene every five years or so and says, you know, something we've realized is that the church is dying. New churches always come and tell you the church is dying. You ever notice that? The church is dying the way it is, and you're always stuck in tradition. One of the traditions you have is, you know, going to church on Sunday. People don't go to church on Sunday anymore. We need to make church convenient for people. Let's have it on a Friday night. Or let's have it on a Saturday night. Well, you want to ask me the question, do I have a problem with believers meeting and worshiping Jesus on Friday or Saturday night? My answer is the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Right. Friday belongs to Jesus. Saturday belongs to Jesus. But Sunday's the Lord's day. See, and uh, there's a difference. In other words, it's not a legalistic thing. That I'm saying, all I'm saying is you're really missing something if you don't think the Lord's day is an important matter. If you don't think it's an important consideration. So here we are going to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Like I promised you, we're not even preaching from Romans chapter or from Romans tonight. So we're skipping a lot of the Bible here. You go to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and I'd like to read some more things that happen on the Lord's day. The Bible says in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 16, now it's concerning the collection for the saints. As I've given order unto the church of, of Galatia, even so do ye. So Paul said, I told the church of Galatia to do something about the collection for the saints. What was the collection for the saints? I'm not going to preach about it tonight, but I don't want anyone to leave here confused. It was an offering that was taken up from different churches around the world to support the persecuted brethren at Jerusalem. And it was also a collection that was taken up for the ministers of the gospel as well, like the deacons and like the apostles and their traveling teams. It was the way they were supported to do the work of the ministry. And you can look at the Scripture and it's really plain and apparent that that's what it was. The Christians... Uh, people who were saved no longer had to give to the tithe to support the temple. They now just gave. And uh, actually, in many instances, they gave more. They just gave everything instead of giving 10%. But the Bible says here, where Paul is writing to the church, he's actually giving something with his apostolic authority. And he's saying, I'm going to tell you the same thing I told the other churches that are at Galatia. And so this is not an isolated something that he's telling the church at Corinth. That's my point. You get it? Paul is not telling the church at Corinth something that's just for them. It's exclusive to them. He's telling I'm telling you what I've told everyone else. On the first day of the week, verse 2, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. He said, we don't need to have this great big collection when I come to town. He said, just need to every first day of the week, 
uh, take up an offering for the ministering to the saints. What does that assume? It assumes the believers got together every first day of the week. See? And uh, that's pretty simple, isn't it? Now, it doesn't take, like I say many times, a rocket surgeon to figure this one out. It really only takes a person who just looks at what obviously is there and asks the question, is there something here? And the answer is, yes. There's a lot of emphasis in the Scripture on the Lord's Day or the first day of the week. And a couple of things that we see happening specifically on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, is the offering. Now, some people at our church uh, may hear me say this. I've said before, there are really two reasons that we take up an offering in the church. The first reason that we take up an offering on a Sunday morning is because the Bible says to. And I've said before, you know, I'd do it even if I didn't think it was, there was any use in it. In other words, if we couldn't figure out what to do with the money, if we had to open up the back door and just toss it in the yard or bury it or something, we'd still take up an offering because the Bible says to do it. And I do believe my Bible enough that if the Scripture says to do something, I believe we ought to do it. There's a right way to do it. Uh, that's why when people call me all the time and say, hey, Pastor, we have a great opportunity for a fundraiser, I say, you know, we don't do fundraisers in our church. Well, how do you support things? How do you raise money? Uh, God's people give on the first day of the week. Are fundraisers against the church? No, 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 no. I'm not making up... I'm not anti-something. Oh. But I will say that the way for the church to be supported is for God's people to give. And the right time to actually give is the first day of the week. You say, Pastor, then why do we take up a uh, Wednesday night offering? Because we're just greedy. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I've thought about it. Some Wednesday nights, if we have something special going on, we don't take up an offering. You don't miss it. A lot of times, I've actually had people say, Pastor, why did we not take up an offering tonight? But a lot of people don't even notice we didn't take up an offering. And the reason is what just didn't fit with what we're doing. But it is a part of a worship service. And so if we're meeting in the midweek to worship, I think it's perfectly fine since we're going to preach to go ahead and take up an offering. And it's fine to do so. But the time it's commanded to do so is the first day of the week. So that's why we do it. Now, you say, Pastor, what's the second reason? Well, the second reason is because God's way, in answer to your question, Tashi, God's way actually works really well. I've found that the giving of God's people uh, makes us a lot less beggarly. It's a little frustrating to me sometimes to see a man in a suit standing on a street corner begging people that don't go to church to support the ministry. In other words, people that mock God saying, hey, why don't you give to it? You know, it makes a mockery, I think, sometimes out of spiritual things. My question to people... Uh, that do fundraisers is, is if your church people won't support it, why should I? In other words, if the people that go there to your ministry don't believe it enough that they'll they'll get behind it and support it, why should I support it? In other words, who knows if a, a ministry is, has value and worth? Well, the people that are involved in it, right? If you don't want to pay to send your choir to Amsterdam, well, then I'm not going to. Uh, if you don't want to pay to send your kids to camp, well, then why should I? I'm, I'm not saying you can't accept funds any other way. But there is a Bible way, and the Bible way is on the first day of the week. The Paul, Paul said, I don't want a collection when I come. Because when Paul came to town, he didn't want it to be, oh, Paul's here to get everybody's money. Come on, y'all. It wasn't one of these big, uh, you know, tent revival meetings and faith healing services where the man keeps passing the offering plate again and again and again. It says, not enough. God knows you can give more. And uh, then every, when he leaves town, everybody knows, man, they held us hostage until we gave them money. Paul said, I don't want to be about money when I come. You take up an offering in the worship service, and uh, there's not going to be any gathering when I come. When I come, that's not what it's going to be about. Paul didn't want them to confuse his ministry. Well, wouldn't it be great if ministers today had that mindset? You know, you can't give tonight. This isn't a time for giving. I'm sorry. If you want to give, you've got to go to church on Sunday. I've knocked on doors and people say, well, I'd like to send something to your church. I'd like to give a little something. And I always tell them, I'm very, very sorry, but you have to come to church to give. Is that in the Bible somewhere? Well, I've over-applied it just a little bit, but I don't want people to misunderstand. In December, when we go Christmas caroling and people think we're out trying to raise funds, I don't want them to think we're trying to raise funds. I want them to know we're trying to share Jesus. We're not trying to get something. We're trying to give something. And if you want to give something... Come give it to the Lord on the resurrection day. Do you see that? Isn't that beautiful? Okay, let's finish up tonight. Uh, there's some other verses we could mention. 
Uh, we could talk about Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25 when the Bible says not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. My assumption is that the time when a person really ought to forsake is when everyone for sure met, and that's the first day of the week. Do you follow that? Does that make any? Does that make good sense for you? And then let's just go to Revelation chapter one and verse ten. We'll finish up tonight. Paul said this: "I was in the spirit on the Lord's day." Now, now let's read verse nine to get the picture. I said Paul. I should have said John. I, John, who also am your brother, verse nine of Revelation one. I am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom of patience of Jesus Christ. Was in the isle that's called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So why was John in Patmos? Well, church history tells us he was exiled there after he was boiled in oil and survived it. He was the one that the Lord willed that he would tarry till I come, or at least he wasn't put to death like the rest of the disciples. But John was exiled on the Isle of Patmos, and the idea here is in exile he was very alone. And this experience that he describes of seeing the Lord and being given the revelation of future events of what God's going to do. He, would, he didn't share with someone else. He was by himself. But it's interesting what he was doing. He said, I was in the Spirit. What day? On the Lord's Day. What day do you suppose that may have been? Sunday. The first day of the week of the Lord's Day. And that's what we call it as believers. And even by himself, John didn't say, well, I'm all alone here on this island. Uh, there are no other Christians. I'm exiled from other believers in this place. And so we cannot assemble and uh, have preaching and uh, hymns and, and offering and all these things. But guess what? John said, you know what? It's the Lord's day and I need to go and be in the Spirit. And he went and had a, had a one man. It wasn't where two or three are gathered together in my name. It was just where I'm at, I'm in the Spirit on the Lord's day. In other words... Uh, John, John said, you know, I'm a worship the Lord Jesus on the Lord's day. And I would have to say that that example of one of the men who was an eyewitness of the Lord Jesus and the way he worshipped Jesus was a pretty great example. Don't you think? In other words, I just think that if John thought it was important, that there might be enough to it that I don't think it's important. And so, Christian, it's Wednesday and you're here and you're benefiting by something, you say, Pastor, I wish you preached that on Sunday. Well, people skip church on Sunday just like they do on Wednesday. It wouldn't make any difference when you preach When you preach that. The reality of it is, is you're here, and you've heard it, and God's put something in your heart. And I would ask you to take the Word of God and to ponder and consider whether or not there might be something here about the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. And I believe it will be a real help for you. The truth of the matter is, is that this is not a message that pastor is motivated to preach so that we can get a better Sunday attendance. I'd like to have a better Sunday attendance because I'd like to preach to more people. And I'd like to be able to influence and affect more lives. I'd like to see God do more. So I'd like to have uh, a better Sunday attendance. But actually my motivation isn't to try to stir people up and get more out of people. I get calls all the time, like Tashi had asked a question, but I get calls all the time for fundraisers where people say, do you realize your people aren't giving uh, very much? We can get your people to give. this. They want to come into our church and work our people and get more, and they want to take a percentage of what they get our people to give. And, uh, you know, I say to them, I don't want to get our people to give anything. I want people to give to the Lord Jesus. We're not about that. That isn't the motivation. So why would I preach about it? Is it because... Giving is the emphasis of the first day of the week? No, it's because worshiping Jesus is the emphasis of the first day of the week. And let me ask you a question. There are two individuals who benefit by worship. Who are they? Who? What would you say? Jesus. Jesus. You think God's glorified when we worship Him? Yeah, God, God benefits when we worship Him. Who else benefits by worship? We do. We do. We do. And so what I tell you this evening is actually not to manipulate, uh, not to persuade for any um, desired outcome on my part. What I'm telling you is something that's actually a breakthrough for you if you'll believe it and you will apply it. You'll be amazed at what God will do and you'll testify of it. Matter of fact, we're not going to do that this evening, but let me just have a show of hands. How many of you could testify that you're taking the first day of the week and making it a priority has been a breakthrough in your life. How I many of y'all could say that? Yeah, isn't that something? I mean, all of us could spend time tonight saying, you know, when this became important to me, God started doing something, and we could all tell different reasons why. And so, this is a transcendent truth, and you kind of knew it, 
perhaps you really knew it, but I wanted to preach it this evening because I want you to have clarity about it. Because one of those things that if you get off on it, it'll be a hindrance in your life. But if you get it, you'll go to places you'll never go back to. You'll get beyond. Father, thank you for what we've learned. We ask that you increase the truth of it and knowledge of it in our hearts. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's take a minute and have a prayer request. I know I'm a little bit over tonight, but let's let's do that. If you need to slip out, that's all right. No one will be offended. Let's take some prayer requests at this.